So, welcome back to Third Age Reforged and to another battle replay and to another preview of the upcoming patch. And it is worth saying that this is the first replay that I'm going to be doing since getting back from a trip away for work. So, I have got quite a few messages in Discord regarding uh, replays I have been given since then. But I'm going to be doing this one first because I got sent this one before I went away ultimately and didn't have the chance to do it then. And with the fact that quite a few of the replays I'm going to be doing in the upcoming days, I think, are going to be 2v2s from an ongoing tournament for the moment. So I th there may very well be little tweaks to game versions. So I think it is going to behoove me really to do things in chronological order of when I was sent them. I think that is the sensible thing to do. Um, so again, I will be getting to those other ones uh, fairly soon. And, in stark contrast, really, to when I went away, it seems like there's going to be a lot of activity on the channel in the upcoming days, hopefully. Um, as long as I can keep up with uh, juggling this and work, we can uh, we can expect some decent things coming out of Reforged in the in the upcoming few weeks. And uh, yeah, that can only be a good thing. This is an Elven map, which was sent to me by Tommy, I believe it was, and it's going to be Elven Defenders and Human Attackers. So it's not going to be good versus evil, but it is going to be... Um, elves versus men. So elves on the defense, of course, in a 3v5 have got tons of quality, but very often the very small nature of their armies means that they can be overrun, albeit the human kingdoms that are on display today are not entirely numbers focused themselves, so while they do have a numbers advantage, they can't quite throw themselves into the fray in the same way that orcs and some of the evil men can, for example. We'll go through the settlement in just a moment, we will start with the attackers and Tommy himself is going to be one of the attackers today playing as Dole Amroth. So Dole Amroth of course have got a fairly good selection of infantry, in particular heavy swordsmen like this. The Haven Guard and the Thalon are going to be the pride and joy of their army and this does mean that they can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the elves at least in this unit class better than most perhaps. Um, they should have uh, a good edge there in comparison to some of their allies. Standard Dol Amroth spearmen armoured up. Um, again, this is going to be much more of a functional unit, albeit standard spears and standard swordsmen for the attacking forces today are going to be very important. They're going to tend to have pretty decent armour like the Dol Amroth spearmen to have good shield values. In melee terms, of course, they're not going to be as damaging or as defensively gifted as the equivalent defending units today, but the numbers and the overall average level of quality that they bring to the table as well as survivability is going to be important. So we'll be seeing much more of that sort of thing moving forward, I'm sure. Quite a few units are going to be hidden in the shrubs that the outer parts of this map offer. Dol Amroth Spearmen here. The Dol Amroth Men at Arms, slightly bigger in terms of their unit size. Of course, they're going to be a little bit better at dealing damage to the units on the defence, though again, in terms of the quality they're going to be facing, it's going to be much more about their ability to stand, fight, and take punishment, and ultimately overwhelm the enemy, which is going to be giving Dol Amroth the edge in this regard. Plenty of these units though, so the heart and soul of the army today. Talon Knights, another strong unit this, and of course one of the upper end units means they are going to be a little bit more of a threat one to one to the Elven Defenders. Armour piercing like this can be useful, particularly against Imladris and slightly against Lothlorien as well, though it does often come with the offset, especially with human units, that they're going to be a little bit less on the base attack and a little bit less in the melee defence as well, so Swings and roundabouts, it could be useful for giving them an edge against certain units. A couple of units off them as well. Of course, they're pretty sturdy with their shields and armor also. Attacking arch is going to be an interesting one here. This kind of settlement, a cityscape once again. It's going to depend largely on the positioning of defending archers and infantry as to whether or not the attackers can be really efficient with their archers. If they can, 3v5s, it's very difficult for the defenders to do the job there. Unupgraded Dol Amroth archers are purely going to be here putting the pressure on, they're not going to beat any Elven units one-to-one, -one, which is going to be the theme across all of these attacking units, really, but the uh, they should be able to do a good job when it comes to pure volume. Belfalas Marines, Javelins, of course, the sort of thing which if you can manoeuvre them into the correct position, uh, they can and will do a lot of damage very, very quickly to exposed units, not the sort of thing the Elves can afford at all with their lower unit sizes, so they're going to have to be on the lookout for attacking Javelins, manoeuvring themselves into positions. And several units of the Halberdiers, foregoing the Pikes, which is an interesting one. Um, the Halberdiers, of course, are a little bit more well-rounded. They're certainly a stronger unit when it comes to their armour. 
and their abilities to fight in more conventional mob style battles perhaps, the armor piercing as well, and ultimately it is still a phalanx but they do lack the extra range that pikes can offer. Moving on, we have Tweak, who's playing as Rohan, which is going to be an interesting one. The Red Shields of Urkenbrand, so some horse archers. Sallying out for the elves in a map like this, considering the opposition, would be very bold, but the Red Shields will be a good thing for mopping up these kinds of units. They can kite them around, and then they're also pretty damn good as melee cavalry as well. Um, if Other than that, they're really going to be just used as a harassment unit, I think, and maybe a sort of final blow in terms of the mass that they can offer going forwards. Westmark Infantry, a little bit more of an expensive sword and board unit this, a little bit lower in terms of the man count as well. It does mean that their quality is a little bit higher and they won't melt away in the face of the elves quite so much. And Rohan, unlike many of the other Western Kingdoms, tend to prioritise maybe a little bit more damage than, uh, than armour, for example. So the equipment of their allies may be a little bit stronger, uh, but the Westmarks should do a little bit better perhaps than their contemporaries one-to-one, -one, but it's still going to be a tough one for them if they come under Elven Arrow Fire, especially for the Riddermark Axemen over here, Rohan of course, well known for having a good armour-piercing component to their infantry. Riddermark Axemen certainly offer that, but the lower melee defence and of course the lack of shields on their front means that archers and more skilled Elven infantry will butcher them if they do not have the appropriate support, but the extra attacking sting they offer will be useful. Westmark Marshals will be able to look after themselves a little bit more. They have the same weaknesses, really, uh, but they're going to be a little bit less susceptible to them, and ultimately their strengths are also a little bit more well-defined. Big damage coming off of those two-handed axes. We have a few units of Eastmark Spearmen, cheap but cheerful Javelin men. We have the Westmark Spearmen, the equivalent to the Westmark Infantry in the front. Again, lower in terms of unit size, perhaps, which Rohan have gone a little bit more quality-heavy here, which is going to be interesting to see if that works out for them. Shield Maidens throwing axes could be really, really useful, especially against some of the unshielded and more lightly armoured elven units. Not the sort of thing they can afford to, or not the sort of damage they can afford to take at all. Only one unit of foot archers by the looks of it. Helmingas and the Medusald Guard, good unit of javelins, very good unit of javelins combined with bodyguard tier sword and board or axe and board unit, I suppose, in melee. Moving on, the third attacking army, we have Arthur Dane, played by Killeen. High Lords of Anuminus, we've seen them previously, of course, before. The strongest of the Arthurdanian infantry, sword and board, very, very potent, very, very tough to kill, even for the elves. The shields and armor are going to be tough to crack through. Anuminus Gate Guards, the first example of a pike unit we've seen from the attackers today, and it's a good one as well. The strongest of the Arthurdanian pikes, good for encouraging nearby units as well to stay in the fight. Arthurdane Spearmen. Very similar to the Double Admiral Spearman we've seen before. Looks like varying levels of armor upgrades here as well. Some with the full level of armor upgrade, some with only the breastplate. But any upgrade is going to be useful for mitigating the Elven range damage, which is of course so well known. Arthur Man at Arms, very similar to the Dole Amroth equivalent as well, only slightly more numerous, which is going to be a big boon for them. Bit of a gap here, there could be Dunedain. In fact, I would thoroughly expect Dunedain to be a part of the attacking force. Arthur Day Marksman. And of course the Wardens of the North. The Elves really don't want the Wardens of the North to get into a good firing position with their armor-piercing arrows because the Elves are going to be very reliant on their high-end units really performing well. The Wardens are one such unit for ideally dealing with them. Lords of Gondor, another cavalry unit, much more of a straight-up uh, lance unit this though than the Red Shields that we saw from Rohan, but still another unit which can be useful for preventing any sort of sally outs or at least harassing them. And late on, if the battlefield does become a little bit stretched, hammer and anvil strikes on defenders can really end their battle pretty comprehensively. Veterans of Osgiliath unupgraded. Very often we've seen the Veterans of Osgiliath with gold level armor upgrades in this version of the game now. So it's going to be a bit of a rarity, I think, that we see them unupgraded like this, but still a very fine unit of skirmishing archers indeed, which the defenders will not be too pleased to see. Gondor Spears, unupgraded once again. The trebuchet is here, standard trebuchet, so no trebuchet of Numenor crew to go with it, but still some standard Gondor infantry and spears. Fountain Guard are hidden, more Gondor infantry are hidden, Pelagia Marines, Gondor infantry, Axemen, nothing too surprising here. Plenty of the standard units, not a huge amount of armour upgrades going on. There is for the Axemen of Lasarnak, but standardised units don't seem to have been given that, which is weird from hidden, seeing as how Gondor do have access to cheaper upgrades, but... Sometimes that's just how the budget works out. And finally, we do actually have a Dwarven component to the attack as well. Panthan and Barsoom marching with the Dwarves of the Blue Mountains. Spearguard, 
mean, the dwarves, in terms of quality, can certainly go toe to toe with the elves, of course. Standard spear, or well, upper end spears, this, so very defensively all together. We have the marksman of Thorin's halls, very good at skirmishing as well. Of course, the Blue Mountains having this bigger focus on their ranged components means that they can make life more uncomfortable for the elves if they choose their positions poorly. Wands of Thorin's Halls as well, good unit to bring against the elves, that dual wielding going to offer them that extra melee defense which will help them out in those long engagements and the axes for more damage as well. Standard warriors of the Blue Mountain, standard dwarven units are going to be very well rounded of course as they always are. Juggernauts, it's going to be interesting to see how the elves deal with them because it's one of perhaps the better units of infantry for going 1v1 against some of the best things the elves have to offer. Guardians of the Blue Mountains once again. And we have the Frost Spears and the High Thanes of Azagal. So we have a pretty similar to the Metasau Guard really, only I, the High Thanes are Halberdiers in melee I believe. Um, and then we have the Frost Spears which are pretty much a completely unique unit, repeaters really. Positioning going to be key for them, they do need a clear line of sight to be at their very best. Now then, moving on to the defenders, we have a huge blob from T.S. Nehoff here of Imladris forces, very well renowned for their quality of course, the Gwythi Rockdor, I did mention how sallying out with the cavalry isn't going to be the easiest of tasks with Rohan and Gondor bringing cab of their own, but it's not going to be impossible, it's not as if the attackers have got a plethora of crossbows and other anti-cavalry tools, and the Gwythi Rockdor ultimately do have the beating of both of those units one to one, so could be potentially very dangerous, Spears of Rivendell a good mainline unit to have on the front. Elder Enway Archers, of course Imladris a little bit more about their brute strength in melee, but they do still have access to those very strong Elven Archers as well. Gwythi Arthand in there is a very strong unit of Elven Spears. Unsurprising to see the Myrdain rolling around within this mess as well. Gwythi Myrdain of course with the two hammers, so the armor piercing going to be pretty much universally useful. Less so perhaps against Rohan, but still even there, the uh, the armor values will be curtailed. Plenty of Elder Enway in terms of swords and spears as well. Kind of difficult to differentiate a lot of these units, but we will see them as the battle unfolds, I'm sure. Further over here, we have more of his units, actually, with the Imladris sentries. Elder Enway archers, so defensive Elven pikes, of course. Very damaging. Pikes do tend to do damage slowly, but Elven pikes go about their business a little bit more swiftly, perhaps. Elder Enway swordmasters certainly do as well. Swords of Rivendell good unit of perhaps lighter infantry but they're still capable of dishing out an awful lot of damage and then is the entirety of the rest of their armies over here Mirkwood and Lorien yes it is so Mirkwood under the command of Dabo a couple of units of Hiri Ek several units of Hiri Lang with the armor upgrades as well Mirkwood of course less armor focus but you can increase that a little bit because they do have access to more armor upgrades than many of the other elven factions to sort of bring them into line a little bit more with Lothlorien, perhaps the Palace Guard, one of the finest all-round units of infantry that the game has to offer with armor piercing and anti-cavalry and all that elven skill that goes along with it as well. Elven King's Guard, two units of them, several units of Hiri Peng and Elder Council. It's a small army this by the looks of it, they probably have a few hidden units as well as Mirkwood and Lothlorien often do, but still you can see the numbers discrepancy very clearly here. A Ballista from Winged Swordsman 44 as well, going to be key for those to be used effectively given the discrepancy they're working with. Galathrim Archers and Galathrim Axemen in there as well, of course Lothlorien have access to throwing axes more readily in their roster now as well, which that kind of damage will be very useful, especially against the unshielded forces on this side of the map. We have some Lorien Archers to give some backup, some Spearmen, some Galathrim Riders as well, obviously in terms of Horse Archers this is going to be difficult thing, looks like two units of them, and difficult for the red shields to deal with, so perhaps the cab advantage is in favour of the defenders here, but that does mean that they're going to need to get a huge amount of value off them, 3v5, you will need to do that if that's the way you're going to play it. Galathrim nobles on foot as well, with their silver thorns, and very strong in melee of course, and then the kindred of Calibor, and very strong unit of throwing axe as well, so plenty of bodyguard tier throwing projectiles here. This is going to require a bit of a cut, I think, because of the distance they have to cover and the defenders are going to rotate themselves around a little bit, I'm sure, to defend this settlement, which has a sunken area in the middle here, but surrounded by higher terrain, which the elves will need to make very good use of. But we shall see that momentarily, I'm sure. A cut, and I will rejoin when the battle is beginning. So we're going to rejoin here, I think. The first blows have not yet been struck, but they are certainly very imminent, and 
I do think that this battle is going to really swing based upon how well the initial elven defense can buy time for their projectiles to really do a lot of the heavy lifting for them. That is often the case in 3v5s. You can't tend to not be able to rely on sheer brute strength in melee to be able to get the job done. You can see here that part of the settlement as well here at the front has been ceded to the attackers almost immediately, which again is the right thing to do. It's a lot of surface area, I think, for three elven factions in particular to try and cover against these kinds of numerical odds, but they are being funneled into these positions. Higher terrain as well, you can see all the archers getting into position, forming up these nasty looking firing lines. Really the one exception to a large defence happening down here on the lowest elevation is going to be over here, with Davo's Mirkwood Force already stacking up against Tommy's Dol Amroth one. But this really is with a purpose as well, because you can see in most areas there's one, at least one, often two, areas of fire that the defenders are going to be able to take advantage of. Lothlorien taking responsibility for trying to hold Rohan at bay. Rohan's melee defense is certainly going to be called into question here. And they're not the most rigid, especially in comparison to all the attackers today, but they do have maybe a little bit more of an edge in terms of the overall quality they've decided to bring, and throwing projectiles make them perhaps more dangerous as a damage dealer, as is often the case, than a force that's going to be in it for the long haul in the same way that in particular the Numenorean factions are going to be here with their numbers. Time will tell whether the Blue Mountains quality is going to allow them to be a much better match against a primarily Imladris force over here. And there is another mountain pathway of course which they can take. The ultimate goal is going to be to try and claim the Elven Manor at the top of the hill, undoubtedly, and there are many ways to get up there, trying to claim the highest terrain, and now we can see the March from Thorin's Halls, the opening salvos onto the Noritino Warriors. It is the sort of thing which may very well force the Elven defenders into using their ammunition early, but again, it's much better than having them perish with nothing to show for it, and the Elves do have ultimately more elevation. In terms of a flat skirmish fight, you would back the more heavily armoured dwarves here, but perhaps the elevation will be enough to make the difference there. The other position which is probably going to erupt into a confrontation pretty quickly, I would imagine, is going to be Rohan here. Rohan marching into the jaws, however, of the, really the very centre of the settlement, which means reinforcements can find their way to stop Rohan more readily perhaps than some of the other positions, the Hiri Peng already taking plenty of damage from the Red Shields as they move forward, including the Dol Amroth Archers and of course Merkwood with that slightly lower armour score are going to be less well suited for taking that kind of punishment. And they will need that damage dealing potential throughout the battle as well. Dol Amroth biding their time for now. Panthan still marching forward, Donatino Warriors still doing perfectly well here, Swords of Rivendell, I mean this is going to be over pretty quickly in favour of Imladris, at least this initial attack, the Warriors of the Blue Mountains, we mentioned how as far as a basic unit of Dwarves go they are perfectly serviceable, but it's not going to go too well when you're considering Elder Enwear here, although they are being pulled back, but the Gwaith are going to absolutely bludgeon through that well-made Dwarven armour, and they do have the backup of the numbers from the Swords of Rivendell as well, maybe a little bit more of a finesse-based unit this, but the Dwarves, the first ones to really come forward with a substantial sort of attack, Noratuna Warriors still taking hits. The Dwarves will be quite happy with the fact that their archers are the ones drawing the ire of the Elven Skirmishers, but Arrow Fire is perhaps a little bit less important for Imladris in comparison to the other forces here, albeit Imladris will still need their archers to do an awful lot of heavy lifting. Gondor and Arthurdain moving forward as one, so this is perhaps where the biggest force is going to attack. So the elves need to be ready for that, although Imladris do have some support there as well. Rohan moving forward, but immediately engaged by some staff masters that were skulking around, and some Lorian spearmen as well. Helmingas moving forward, perhaps a slightly lower amount of Rohan archers. I'm sure that at least another unit was probably hidden as well. Already forcing the elves into retreating some of their skirmishes, which is fine as long as they can be remobilized quickly. Lorian archers also firing. Poison projectiles as well, so morale debuffing, which perhaps Rohan are the ones most likely to flee in the face of 
substantial pressure as the battle goes along. But again, with these kind of numbers, the elves will be pretty happy with the initial outlay of the battle. This over here, meanwhile, we have Belfalas marines and making life very uncomfortable for Merc. Where you have to say that even though it's not a huge amount of losses they've taken, the way that Dole and Roth are approaching this with the support of those Rohirrim horse archers who have peeled off for the time being by the looks of it, but softening the enemy up with even these small amounts of damage can make all the difference in a 3v5, especially against elven defenders. When you go in for the full commitment of units, after all, that's where the elven quality can really start to hammer home, especially if you're boxed away. Like Dole Amroth are for the moment. Well, the Royal Council moving over here as well. So Merc would need to be careful, especially seeing as it's only Dole Amroth over there. They need to be uh, making sure that they maintain their position here, whereas Imladris and Lothlorien are having to juggle four factions between them for the time being. Lothlorien Spearman doing a very good job. This initial assault from this one unit of spears not going too well, but Lothlorien having to counter-attack here, but doing a good job of it. The Helmingast taking a real beating at the hands of the Poison Arrows. The Javelin support now being engaged in melee, so they're having to pull back the crossfire of the poison projectiles as well. And I mean, another unit of infantry is moving forward, but they're going to need to be attacking in more substantial waves than this if they are to gain anything here, Rohan. The Westmark infantry may find itself more suited for dealing with the forces that are arrayed before them now. Those standard Lorian archers doing the business for the time being, and the Javelin's now able to get back in position, thanks to the line infantry taking to the front once more. Helmingas, Westmarks. Meanwhile, a huge amount of rush from Gondor and Arthurdain to join the fray just for the moment, although starting to go about their business in much the same way Arthur Dane Marks and Pelagia Marines were moving forward, but spotted by T.S. Nihoff. And so the Swords of Rivendell are going to be coaxed into melee. They should do quite well against a singular unit of Arthur Dane Spearmen, but they're going to need quick support if they are to hold on to this position for any length of time. And of course, I mean, there are ways to retreat from here, but there is another pathway around there as well, so there are three ways back to what is ultimately the final stand for the defenders today, so if they do lose one position it's not the end of the world, but could end up being pretty pretty gnarly. Meanwhile, Grey Company moving forward, very, very dangerous kind of unit this. Gwythiarth and perhaps more able to withstand their punishment than most, but in Ladris, what started off with quite a lot of promise here, I mean the Gwythi Miradane is still pretty healthy. They need to do something about these Grey Company. I mean, this would be exactly the kind of unit it would be very worthwhile trying to kill off. But uh, a good combined arms assault, this. You can see that the Warns of the North also moving forward now as well to go after the God Helene as they try to move into position. So Imladris definitely being tested now. Gondor and Arthurdain joining the Dwarven Assault. So this may actually be the, certainly the most well-rounded in terms of factions of all the attacking positions, and also juggernauts on the way forward as well, so certainly not wanting in terms of quality either. Some arrow fire from across the river over there would probably not go amiss. Armor piercing also at its most useful against Imladris, but if they can curtail this assault, the one benefit to that from a defending point of view is they, the reinforcements are going to have a fairly long way to march, so they're going to have to be willing to commit consistently here, the attackers, otherwise things could yet fall apart. Another unit of Wardens, however, is a sign that perhaps they are going to be willing to do that. Gwythi Arthand and Myrdane fighting side by side to halt the Dwarven-led advance. There's Guardians of the Blue Mountains in and amongst things as well. Plenty of heavy-hitting Dwarves here, all of that dual-wielding really being brought to bear. Elder Runway Swordmass is in here as well. It's going to need more from Imladris, I think, and more spears are on the way. God Helene going after some of the units that are intended to be reinforcements. And over here, Swords of Rivendell getting shot at point blank by Arthur Marks with fire arrows, which is an interesting one. Even when they're under the cosh like this, Imladris are unlikely to be moved to rout this early. 
perhaps the other way around as well, which could be the site of a counter-attack. I mean, considering Gondor and Arthedain are putting a little bit more stock maybe in helping the dwarves advance around that way and then maybe trying to claim the town centre that way, counter-attack is the sort of thing which could be very useful. Meanwhile, Lothlorien's still pretty comfortable against the Rohan-only assault over here, and that's not too surprising. Rohan, when it comes to dealing with a force like Lothlorien, are going to struggle after all. In terms of infantry strengths, one of the things that Rohan have going for them is that damage, but it's the sort of thing which Lothlorien also have, so when you're caught in a position like this where you can't circumvent a well-prepared Lothlorien front line, their damage is going to be coming your way. And the worst thing for Rohan, of course, as well, is the fact that they don't have the armour to be able to blunt that damage any. So uh, it's going to be pretty nasty for them, Lorien archers. They do have the support, of course. That's the one thing Rohan can bring to bear against Lothlorien and uh, cause their lines to fall apart. Throwing projectiles and and the like. Meanwhile, Dol Amroth archers still. Mirkwood and Dol Amroth yet to really come to blows in a pure melee turn. You know, Belfast Marine's largely dead on the floor here perhaps as a result of the Elder Royal Council, but that's a pretty valuable resource used on a fairly mundane unit in the grand scheme of things. As the Dole Amroth archers start to pull back, would come the Ents, which were hidden until now, of course a monstrous unit of infantry, well Ent Wives as they're, as they're known now, hiding away once again. I mean, clearly a very, very dangerous unit, and not the sort of unit which Dol Amroth have any, many direct answers to, really their heavy swordsmen would be the best thing, but when it comes to dealing with large amounts of rank and file very quickly, as we've seen with the trolls, particularly Olag High and the like, when the orcs are on the field, the Ent Wives offer the same sort of thing for Mirkwood, pretty unique thing, a lot of shock potential in there. So quite a few, a few dead units back here, Galathrim Riders and archers not needed to be committed forward against Rohan just yet, nor are they needed against Arthurdain and Gondor here in the other central lane. Sort of Rimdal doing very well against this one unit of Arthurdain spearmen up to this point though. They will be pretty happy with that. It'd be a distinct possibility. Further along, meanwhile, across the river inroads are being made, territorial gains by the attackers. Again, this union of dwarves and men forcing the elves onto the back foot. As God Halim have been taking hits. I think the Wardens of the North, well, they're still there, but again, those armor-piercing arrows would be a problem, but the terrain advantage that the elves have is also buying them a little bit more time, as it were, and of course the Silverthorn arrows make it difficult to return fire because it knocks units all over the place, as the Wardens of the North are finding out right now, and the Godhelim's support might be enough, although elite Imladris units have been lost in the attempt to hold on to this position, and Karen Amroth rangers are firing down from across the way, so support now arriving from across the river, but infantry-wise Imladris are flagging. They're doing a lot of damage to the attackers as they move through here, but the attackers are making territorial gains that they undoubtedly would have wanted. Noritino warriors retreating. The god Heli may have to retreat as well because Imladris have most assuredly taken a real beating. They do have secondary lines set up, but this does mean, of course, that the final stand will be receiving pressure perhaps sooner than they would have liked, and from numerous sources as well, and I think the door is rapidly closing on TS's ability to save this unit of God Helene. I think he's just about going to manage it. The elves fleeing, scurrying away very quickly, just about managing to get away. They are still going to have to get all the way across the bridge, however. Now, however, the question will be, obviously the Dwarves can afford to send all of their army off that way, but how much support will Arthurdane and Gondor afford them? Well, these Pelagian Marines managing to get a few javelins off, but they're going to be interrupted most harshly by some Elder Enway, and that's going to be, well, it's going to be a very quick end to their skirmishing. Less of a successful for foray, perhaps, than the Belfalas to stab away with their javelins there, but also getting pikes into position. Bit of a two-pronged counter-attack this, and it comes at an interesting moment, because it does, again, pile pressure on Arthane and Gondor. Do they send more units over here to just keep this attack going, 
or do they back the dwarves up in trying to put more pressure around the flank where they do have momentum? Of course, they could split off one and one. The entirety of Gondor could remain here, and Arthurdain could send their entire army in support of the dwarves. That's probably the best way to go about it, more of a sacrificial arm of the attack for the moment, especially given the quality of the Imladris forces that are still here. Elder Enway backed up by pikes, not the easiest thing to deal with. And uh, sending more and more Arthurdain spearmen to try and block the way is probably not going to work. I'm surprised, well, those Plagi Marines are fighting to the death, but also Elder Enway archers from on high over there. Meanwhile, this attack over here has remained pretty much entirely stationary. Really the only difference has been fresh units being committed to the fray. And in all fairness, Westmark Marshals will place Lothlorien under a bit more pressure. The armour that the standard Galathrum units do have will be tested by those axes, but overall the more well-rounded nature of the elves, especially in a more narrow choke point like this, should still stand them in good stead. The support of the Galathrum riders and the Lothlorien archers all around them also proving to be a problem. Tweak not able to use his throwing projectiles or get them into the kind of position which would make them really effective, but he still has plenty of reinforcements, still has plenty of Riddermark Axemen for extra attacking punch, or Westmark Infantry as well as his bodyguard unit, so it's certainly not all over for him yet by any stretch of the imagination. And now a large scale assault coming forward from Dol Amroth as the Entwives march their way forward. Talon Knights might be a bit of a concern for them, those armor piercing on, the ma they armor -piercing on those maces a concern. The Trebuchet now firing away, Gondor moving over here, which makes sense. They've got a bit more of a sight line to use over here. Elven Kingsguard and Woodland Realm Patrol firing away. The Elven Crossfire hitting the Dol Amroth infantry. I mean, they will be hoping that their armor and shields can buy them enough time to keep this attack going. But it's going to be punishing for Dol Amroth. I mean, they, they laid the groundwork well. And now they need to try and trust in their numbers to see them through, but it's going to be certainly painful in the short term. Wooden Realm Axemen helping to slam shut the door that was starting to open. But yeah, these Ents are probably all going to be expended in throwing back this initial Dole Amroth Assault, but the damage spike they're offering is making it difficult for Tommy, at least for the moment. But those numbers, the announcer still confident after all, the Hiri Lan, the Hiri Ek. We shall see for the moment. Having a look at this angle. So it's actually Arthurdain leading the way over here, but they are going to be able to put some pressure on, but maybe it would be best to hold fire over here for the moment. There's not a huge amount up here, though. Maybe it would be worthwhile trying to really put some pressure on up here, and then there's every chance that they could lose their high ground. The fact that the ballista crew is here, they need to be pretty careful. On the edge of a cliff like this, Artillery in Med 2 is well known for sort of sliding off. Well, the way Archer's still there. This is still in the balance. The Elves are doing the damage they need across the field to stay competitive, but they are going to need, I think, some sort of collapse from the attackers still, given the numbers discrepancy which still exists. But Imladris really turning back the Arthurdanian infantry that was trying to make inroads over here. Javelin action from the Citadel Guard as well, a very strong unit that. I don't think you can pass through these ruins over here either, which means those Elder Enway Spearmen are being held in reserve. There's still reinforcements which can be committed to a number of places, but eventually you can't help but feel as though the Elves are going to need reinforcements on every front line, and they're going to have to prioritise or pull back. They need to give themselves enough room to pull back, however. Some more Riddermark Axemen arriving on the front line on the Rohan front. Doing some good damage there. And the force is evenly matched now, where once Lothlorien were looking pretty comfortable, ultimately the seemingly never ending men of the Kalanardon starting to have an impact on those smaller elven units. Elder Royal Council in position. I mean, it's all well and good having them there, but. Another front line needs to be made. It's going to be a pretty nasty 
crossfire there that Rohan will ultimately have to march into. Part of the issue over here is going to be Mirkwood, how much more in the way of reinforcements they really have, with the Realm Patrol still doing their thing. Looks like the Ents have all been dealt with. The Shield Maidens now in play. Are they going to be able to... I mean, they, well, the Antwives, the last one, did just fall. Yeah, they've got a good shot into the Elder Council there. Good fire rate as well. Not the sort of thing which Davo would have been hoping for. Oof. And nor is that. Trebuchet at point blank. Getting some friendly fire, but the majority of the kills were Elven, and when you're the attackers in this situation, a little bit of friendly fire is not the end. In fact, there's still quite a few Entwives in and amongst things over here. I suppose none of these infantry units they're facing off against, other than arguably the Talon Knights, are really going to do that much damage to them. So Dol Amroth continue to take a bit of a beating, but overall, in terms of the proportion of units being lost, I think they will still be reasonably happy with how this is going. Rohan still pressuring from nearby as well means there may very well be a breakthrough over here at some point, and if it is, a lot of the defending strength is still marshalled in and around this quadrant of the map, really. That would be a lot of strength lost all at once, and it's not the sort of thing the defenders could probably weather. Victory seems certain. Only a fool could lose this battle. The Galathrum Spearmen still stand strong. Dealing with all of these Rohirrim. Norian archers. Norian archers now trying to use their poison projectiles to maybe turn the tide once more. I mean, stuff like the Riddermark Axemen are going to do decidedly poorly against them. Westmark infantry getting to the front, but they're not really weak enough that you can mass push them yet. Soon, though, that's the sort of tactic which could be used to great effect. Over here, the Lateris Sentry is still doing a good job. I mean, there's not that many of them left, but certainly we've seen the strength of Elven Pikes in this battle once more, but the Citadel Guard now starting to be the dominant force on the front line. A little bit more quality being interjected. This front line from the attacking point of view has been almost entirely made up of rank and file up until the moment the Citadel Guard entered the fray, and it has put Imladris under a little bit more pressure. Arthur Danian marksman firing away. Elder and Spearman being committed to the front. A little bit more support. Glathrum warriors, I mean that level of armor piercing is certainly going to be a good tonic for dealing with Gondor's continued presence here, even without the armor upgrade, that armor piercing will still be useful against the chain that the Gondorians are wearing. And the archers still doing their thing. I mean, having a look over here based on the minimap, the Dwarves of the Blue Mountains moving across Frost Spears of Azagal, trying to do their thing, reloading their repeaters as we speak, but understandably, given the very good, consistent level of damage they are capable of doing, and based on the sight lines they have, they can hit the Elder Runway. The Elder Runway archers are immediately making a beeline for them. I'm going to force them to retreat. Arthur Dane Man at Arms moving forward to keep the fires of this attack lit, along with Wardens of Thorin's Halls, which have already seen combat against Inladris. Plenty of Elven arrows still hitting their targets. Undoubtedly, this will be another battle where the defenders have very, very impressive kill counts, much like the battle for the Moraquendi Tower we saw recently, but is that going to be enough? Time will tell. They still have those bitey rock door. I mean, late game lancers could be utterly devastating. The ballista's in an interesting position. Is that going to be the answer? I'm not sure. I think taking a quick look at the front line over here to make sure it's still static. It is. If anything, Lothlorien, uh, while they're th the line is pretty thin, it's starting to be buckled in places, but equally Rohan are losing ground as well, so it's an interesting one, but over here meanwhile, I mean it seems, it's almost as if both sides are collapsing, Elder Palace Guard retreating, I think a bigger collapse has probably been on the part of the attackers, a huge pile of corpses split between blue and green colorations, these shield maidens though going after the Hiri line. They have been, since getting into position to support the Dole Emeralds attack, they've been a real thorn in the side of Mirkwood here. 
good amount of damage that. And now, double Amroth spears, victory seems certain for now. Bit of a case of six of one, half a dozen of the other on this front line. I don't think either side will be too thrilled. There's still a couple of Entwives left going to interrupt the shield mains. I think with only two of them remaining, though, the shield mains should probably put an end to them now, but undoubtedly those Entwives will have done a grisly amount of damage to Dole Amroth's infantry. The problem is Dole Amroth still have a bit more left to give. They've got another pretty decent wave in them, really, which can be used for a final assault on the settlement coordinated with everyone else, whereas Mirkwood I don't necessarily know if they have the ability to engage in that kind of fight again. Entwise receiving a little bit of support from some Woodland Realm Patrol and Woodland Realm Axemen support as and where it can be given. But with Spears and another slew of Dole Amroth units, I think they're trying to finally break the Mirkwood resistance after a bit of a mini collapse of their own, but they can go again, like I said. Can Mirkwood Palace Guard moving forward again? I mean, that will be the test of whether they can or not. It will certainly be a test for these Dole Amroth infantrymen. Still with support as well from the Elder Royal Council, Marie Peng. Not just the Entwives, of course, doing the damage over here, but certainly the support of the very damaging retinue of Mirkwood archers doing the business. Elven Kingsguard using their axes in melee now as well, that extra bite of armor piercing. But as much as these individual units are impressive, Dol Amroth have a whole other way for Mirkwood to deal with. Do they have the ability to form a cohesive line and let that quality do its work? I mean, over here you would say possibly not, because they're starting to run through, but this is where the archers are focusing their fire, and they will do pretty pretty effective damage against those halberdiers. Plenty more Dol Amrothians will fall. Mirkwood may very well have the beating of Dol Amroth, but... As the defenders, you need to be able to beat one and a half armies, not just one, in this kind of situation. And Lorien's lines are starting to look ever thinner against the grinding effect that Rohan have been having on them over here. Rohan themselves, of course, similar to Dol Amroth, have the ability for one last big push, really, I think. And how successful that's going to be really depends on how much ammunition I think the defenders have left which I think they should be okay actually over here if push came to shove but if they're okay over here are they going to be okay without those resources elsewhere I mean another feature of this battle really has been the effectiveness of some of the Latras' units in melee you'd have to say these Elder Runway Spearmen have certainly turned back the tide showcasing who is truly the superior spear unit against the Gondorian Citadel Guard pushing forward and trying to interrupt those archers, Medicel Guard being forced into retreat, really. It's a sort of valiant counter-attack, this, but there's only so much, surely, that this is going to be able to achieve. If the Medicel Guard turn around, and in particular with the arrival of something like the High Lords of Illuminus on the front line, as long as they have the numbers to support these high-quality units, the attackers, you'd imagine, the Elven numbers will start to fall apart, but it's all a little bit higgledy-piggledy. We need more units to come forward and help out. Dunedain Rangers. We've got more Gondor infantry on the way forward and more Axon and Lasarnax. They will arrive. It's not the most organised thing, but they should still be okay, the attackers, given all that is going on. Galathrim Riders retreating. The Ballista firing away. And they can go after individual units like this. They've been a friendly fire there, unfortunately for them, but... We shall see how that develops. Again, momentum still forcing their way ever forwards. It's a it's a bloody path they're forging, the attackers, but they are stepping down it, one brick at a time. Arthurday Man at Arms. I mean they do have a bit of Dwarven support, but against Galathrum Axeman, this may be where things start to fizzle out unless more reinforcements are forthcoming, although the High Thanes an excellent reinforcing unit as well as the Juggernaut, so some very strong Dwarven reinforcements on the scene. Javelin's going to... it's not the easiest angle of attack this, and many of the Javelin's going directly up into the air. They will fall down and many of them will hit. And there goes... I think that would be the Mirkwood General. 
given the red shield's position and well we have our yes indeed it was we have our answer as to whether or not Merkwood had it in them to form a cohesive line the answer is ultimately no everything that Dol Amroth have left is over here now which is not hugely substantial but it's going to be enough to make the defenders lives incredibly uncomfortable really Yuri Peng fighting hard they will of course still be inflicting that toll on the at attackers but the level to which you need to be dealing damage against attackers in a 5v3 is extremely substantial and thus far I don't think they've been able to do it I think the time may be for them to have to take a chance on their cavalry getting a few very very good charges off Galathrim archers Karen Amroth Rangers joining the fray, two handed swordsmen in melee, of course, so not the sort of thing the Rohirrim will be too happy to see. This static fight remains static. This one over here, the site of a counter attack, the Gwaithi Rock Door nearby, hoping perhaps for an opportunity to break out into the open field, but I don't think that's going to happen. That, based on the bridge's position, I would assume that to be the Dwarven General. Ironically, probably the General which is least useful to kill off. Now you can see the Doom by Troll Slayers. The thud of the Frost Spears as well, or at least what very little of them remain. Only three of them, of course. Galathrum Riders in position to take advantage of their specialty projectiles. It's a pretty bloody assault, this, but the attackers, as long as they can keep it going, I think that would be enough from their perspective. The early gains they made will be enough for their allies elsewhere to do the business, I think, given the level of effort the defenders are having to put in to maintain their position up here. And ultimately, I mean, they may not be able to do that, even though the general was lost. The dwarves are not going to flee. All of the human generals would have been a better, a better scalp than that. Elder and Way Archers point blank. That is going to be the case, but they are going to get into melee. And you can see how f relatively few of them have been killed off. Obviously multiple HP. Obviously that Dwarven armor as well. And now... I mean, really, they use their axes like halberds, although of course they don't have a spike on the end. They would have to sort of use that triangle bit. But of course, I guess Dwarves are strong enough that they can utilize it as such. Dunedine Troll Slayers, of course, now Dunedine Rangers have the axe, the Troll Slayers have a spear in melee, which in theory, of course, would make them better against trolls. You want a longer weapon against such a large foe, but in practice I don't know if that's necessarily true, given the spear malice and the fact that trolls are effectively very heavy infantry units. Karen Amroth Rangers and Galathrum Nobles, a bit of a makeshift retreat here. I mean, they're committing more units over against Rohan, so effectively I think they're hoping that the sheer amount of damage they can do at range to these units as they move forward. Nimlothian Honor Guard now is a big ask for the defenders from here. This final assault is going to have all of the attackers' high quality units that they still have, of course. They don't have all of them remaining to them. But a good amount of numbers with that central quality. The elves have already had to use their quality, really, just to get to this point where they were fighting the attackers mostly to a standstill. But it's the ultimate endurance test, really, a 5v3, and I don't think the defenders are going to be able to pass it this time out. Ridamark Axman moving forward, taking arrow fire on the approach. There's Lorian archers here to just try and keep this front line going. I don't know if they're necessarily going to be able to retreat too much more. Lathrim archers. To give the elves their due over here, Elder Royal Council still firing away, Hiri Peng. Dol Amroth have not really been able to make this stick, although the presence of the Imladris cavalry over here may go some way to explaining why that is. This was the part of the battlefield that was the most stretched, so it is the best part of the field for the cavalry to be getting involved with. The trebuchet has definitely been a factor, manned by its Gondorian spearmen. They may just be able... Well, there goes the Dol Amroth general, so the defenders may be able to pull off a victory over here. They don't have the most units left to them to be able to send them to other parts of the field, but it is something. It does give them a puncher's chance elsewhere. It's still with that very dangerous unit of Gwaithi Rock Door.
Eerie Pang as well. It's a distinct possibility. These elves still, I mean, they still will have to deal, of course, with the very, very dangerous unit of Haven Guard, but Elder Royal Council should be able to do that with the backup of the Elven Brothers. And Sisters, in the case of some of the units of Archers, actually, on a, on a closer look. Elder Royal Council, I mean, Rohan, this battle which has been static for the longest time, finally the ocean breaks. Rohan able to get through. I mean, they won't have too much over here. The Medicel Guard, of course, decided to support elsewhere, so pretty much the entirety of what Rohan have left over here is all they're going to be able to work with. Gondor Infantry scrambling to get up that hill. So they will be able to win. I mean, Merkwood are going to have to retreat up to the town centre that way, essentially, to reinforce it from the now two-sided assault it's facing. This engagement down here is a bit of a footnote, really. It's just a case of Rohan having to finish off what remains of the Lorian defenders. Galathrim archers also being blocked from retreating any further, and they will be killed off as well, considering it's Nimlothian honor guard that are blocking the way. Final 10k frames, though, and more and more, it's going to all come down to the high ground. Karen Amroth rangers standing in the way of the initial assault here, made up of just a unit of Gondor infantry, though the attack will get more and more significant as time goes along, I am sure. Galathrin Noble's Ballista over here as well. Bolts. I mean, if they use their flaming shot, if they get some good angles, they're getting good hits, but it's not the impacts that something like a trebuchet would have. Or a catapult. Dunedain Troll Slayers moving forward. The presence of the Kindred of Caliborn seems to have stopped this attack for the most part. The Thanes and the Juggernauts of Azagal. Dunedain Troll Slayers starting to falter as well, so not a huge amount left on the very front. Gondor still have a few units they can commit forward as well, but Lorien's finest just about enough to prevent this advance from happening. And again, another little victory. It's another thing which gives the defenders that little bit of hope going into the later stages of the battle. I mean, Kindred of Caliborn, of course, dual wield is very tough to kill off in melee, especially when they're much, much fresher than the bodyguard units that the Dwarves of the Blue Mountains are working with now. Still got that support as well from a depleted but still damaging unit of Galathrin Riders, and at this point in time, anything that you have left at your disposal is going to be useful. Merkwood, the Madisel Guard down there, getting in the way of these retreats, but there's Rinnemark Axeman getting charged, and Madisel Guard as well. Not the most devastating charge, that, but still able to kill off a few more, trying to salvage as many of these Merkwood units as they possibly can, retreating them. Madisel Guard going after the Hiri Peng. Again, just trying to make sure that Merkwood can't retreat as many of these units as possible. Further afield, there are the Lords of Gondor who probably should be taking more of an active role in going after the Gwaithi Rock Door. If only to get in the way, they would lose one to one, of course, but in a real battle situation, things can get messy and you can get infantry over to help them, but it's more a case of just trying to stop the Elven cavalry from charging around and doing as it will. Plenty of Rohan infantry still here. The Galathrim archers end up routing here, Gwaithi Rock Door making its way over here to try and charge into the Gondor infantry. Volume of kills is going to be an important thing as well, of course. Sort of all hands to the pump at this stage. Veterans of Osgiliath. And not really a charge, but not really given the opportunity for a charge because of the terrain. We can get a nice flat charge here into the Gondor infantry. They do manage to do so. They're going to need plenty more of that. Late game cavalry, especially when the battlefield gets more stretched like this, can be a bit of an equaliser. They may have too much left to do, however. Victory is almost a certainty for the Gondor infantry as they continue to trudge forwards. 
Alistair continues to whiz through the air. Is it really doing the damage necessary, though? It's the Melvin units in behind enemy lines over here, which is interesting. They've managed to worm their way to this point. Galathrin warriors going after Arthur Day marksmen. You'd think with that many, the Arthur Day marksmen would still be okay, but I guess they are facing off against a pretty scary unit of Elven Axemen. Meanwhile, up here, Kindred of Caliborn and Galathrim Riders, the very best Lothlorien have to offer, still standing in the way. Gondor moving their way forwards now, Axemen of Lasarnak and Veterans of Osgiliath. This is all that remains of this assault over here, though. There's some very scattered units of Dwarves who are still fighting to the bitter end, that Dwarven resilience showing itself once more. Gondorians. It's a little bit messy over here now. The Lords of Gondor starting to be used in more of an offensive faction as well. Elder Royal Council being harassed on their way back up and as a result of the Gondor Cavalry they may not be able to make it back up at all. And that's a big loss. It's also a good victory for the attackers to have late on in the battlefield here. It's the sort of thing which can make victory much more difficult to achieve. Yuri Peng continuing to fire away. I mean, it's a good sign that the defenders still have access to ammunition like this. It's the sort of thing which can make the difference in fine margins. The main assault from the attackers is going to be making its way up from here, though. Gwaiti Rockdor continuing to make a nuisance of themselves down there. Can we get another nice charge in here? Again, this is all well and good, but this is going to need to be consistent now. Now until the end of the battle, really. Over here, Ballista Crew, Javelins, Dunedain Troll Slayers trying their best. It's not the best of angles, admittedly, so it's going to be tough for them. Galathrim Nobles, very, very strong, alongside another unit of Elder Royal Council, so the one that did manage to get back up here. Two units of Elven Archers crossed with extremely potent two-handed swordsmen. So far enough to stop Gondor dead in their tracks. It's close. This is very close. Elven Kingsguard, I mean, having a look. Technically speaking, the attackers are still 1% behind. But that's proportion of armies, of course, and that still means the elves are a pretty big numbers discrepancy. Woodland Realm Patrol as well, being tasked with trying to stop Westmark Marshals. Not the easiest task in the world. As they move forwards, East Mark Spearman, Rohan with probably the most well-rounded force remaining to them. That's, I believe, the Lorian general. As the Gwaithi Rockdor continues to cycle charge into the Gondor infantry, the, the trebuchet shot bouncing off the cliff, thudding into the rock, that one hitting, however. And every hit like that is going to be a real problem. Point blanking the Rohan forces as they move forward. I mean, archers are going to be more effective against the more lightly armoured Rohirrim. So they're going to need every bit of that effectiveness now. Frost spear, still two of them remaining. This is going to be a battle determined by its small margins now, though, more than ever. A little bit of extra oomph in the middle of this position now with the Nimlothians to answer the elven bodyguard quality that the attackers are now facing. Rohan's general falls. That's the sort of thing which could cause the attacking effort to become undone. Are these units now shaken? Rohan with so much of the... Well, pretty much exclusively the responsible now. There's a couple of Dolbarmoth units in here, but not anymore there isn't. Rohan need to keep this attack going. They need to make this a more than one front fight because if it is condensed into one front line with Elven Cavalry still buzzing around, with the quality they can bring up front still the Gwaithi Rockdor effectively cycle charging this one unit of Gondor infantry into oblivion, which is all well and good. It means that the unit which started off as having near 200 in it is not on the front line. But they will need, I think, to I mean, one charge into the back of this position over here could be enough to break the attackers. 
if the attackers ultimately end up going on to win this, that may be the difference. Glythe Rockdor going after a unit down there for too long, but looking at the state of play, Galathrum Archers trading back and forth with Veterans of Osgiliath. Veterans of Osgiliath winning that fight as well. What very little remains of the Kindred of Calibor. They did a really good job up until this point, but ultimately <coughs> the final unit of Gondorians that's over here is going to be enough to finish them off, the veterans. Kind of hard to tell when they're bloodied and when they're not, because their baseline units are already bloodied. The announcer now favouring the elves. And I would have to agree, really, because Rohan starting to flee en masse. The quality that the elves still possess. Elder Royal Council, only seven of them. They did make it up here, ultimately. I don't know what happened to the Lords of Gondor. They were used... Oh, there they are. Only nine of them. In behind enemy lines. They're here in the more pressing fight, admittedly, so this cavalry could make all the difference. Lance is down. They're going to get in here, but the Elven Ballista crew are armed with spears, so if you can't get a really good charge off into them, ultimately, they can pull you down off your mounts and rip you up, and ultimately they're going to get caught here as well. They may get a decent charge off into the Galathrum archers, and indeed they do. Lance is down, not bad. That's the sort of thing the attackers now need to see a lot more of. But they can't get out of here anymore. They are going to get stuck by spear-wielding elves. Here we go. Gwythi Rockdoor. We missed it, but ultimately it's almost as if he heard me. Charged into the back of these units. Regular Gondorians now fleeing. The Nimlothians will remain, but they on their own are not going to be enough considering the level of elven quality that is around them. And consistent cycle charging as well. So yeah, the defenders, that cavalry... Caution thrown to the wind when the cavalry was committed, and ultimately that unit of Gwythi Rockdor has been incredibly impressive. That's the trebuchet is still in active service. It's trying to get some good hits, and if it does get good hits, that could make all the difference. Veterans of Osgiliath have made their way up here now, following their defeat of the Kindred of Caliborn, Lords of Gondor. Only three of them remain, so they got ripped up by the Ballista crew on the way through. Still over a hundred of them, of course, and in terms of sheer numbers, even the Ballista crew are going to make life difficult for the attackers in terms of a late-game comeback for them now. It's the Lords of Gondor. Still the Gondorian General. The loss of the Gondorian General at this stage would probably be game, set, and match. Any sort of substantial infantry units they still have would likely flee. Quite the rock door on their way over to try and interrupt the trebuchet. Gondor Spearmen, of course, so that might be difficult. And now, Elven Kingsguard, 48. That will be enough to deal with the veterans of Osgiliath, even without the Royal Council and the Ballista crew coming over to lend their aid. Still a few arrows flitting back and forth. One Warden of Thorin's all remains. Of course, the veterans of Osgiliath are locked morale, so you will need to kill them off to the last man, but... Sword and board means that they don't really have the damage to be able to fight their way out of a situation like this. The Frost Spears of Azagar. We haven't really seen them at their very best. I mean, you get a kind of an idea of what they could be like, but with only two of them, they don't have the DPS necessary. In go the Lords of Gondor. That was actually a pretty good charge for only two units of cavalry. The General being there as well. He's bloodied, but still defiant. Now then. Quite the Rock Door. 14 of them. Cycle charge against the trebuchet. It's going to make sure the trebuchet can't fire, and ultimately, if they can... Well, that's probably not the best of charges, but if they can build up enough space between themselves and the enemy, they should be able to cycle charge a unit of what is ultimately standard Gondor Spears. Arthur Dane General finally falls. He was on that frontal engagement. Arthur Dane didn't seem to have many troops in there at all for a while now, so he's been plying his trade quietly. Lathrim Nobles. Still two Lords of Gondor around here. Here he pangs still with some ammo as well. Interesting they're still going after the veterans. Seven remain. So yeah, the defenders are going to win this. The elves. They look to be in a bit of a hole in the middle of that battle when things started to fall apart. But they retreated at the right time. I think very key was the fact that despite having a pretty rough opening part of the battle, Davo, with 
getting pulled around by skirmishers. I think that front line with the ant wives and all of that, as much as I said early on in the battle, the rank and file was going to be an import, really important factor for the attackers. Ant wives and all of the really high damage units, as well as the archers that Merc were able to bring to that fight of them, and Dol Amroth ultimately fizzled out. Weren't able to make it work. They did break through, but they didn't have a, the quality then to be able to consolidate that gain. Rohan were stuck in that rut for a long time. They ultimately broke through with enough left in the tank that I would say it was ultimately a reasonable success for Tweak, but ultimately he didn't have enough to make up for what happened elsewhere on the battle. That down there, that engagement, Gondor and Arthur Dane, they sent most of their basic units forward first, and I think Imladris ultimately ended up getting a really good proportional amount of kills down there. Early gains for the Dwarves of the Blue Mountains with the human support over here was good, um, but by the time they got up to the bridge it's almost as if more of it was filtered off elsewhere. Like I mentioned, it seemed like Gondor and Arthur Dane then filtered their units away, letting the Dwarves of the Blue Mountains take the lead alone over here, but the damage done meant they weren't really able to do that as effectively as they'd like. Maybe the attack up here started a little bit too soon, should have waited a little bit longer, maybe skirmished with the enemy as their allies caught up with them to attack through the middle there. There's a lot of things I think the attackers could have done a little differently. Ultimately none of them were outright mistakes though. Good rationing of ammunition as well from the defenders was very key. I did mention how they still had arrows late on in the game. And that's always a good sign of how effective a last ditch defence is going to be. Trebuchet crew. I mean, I think the Gwaithi Rockdor, as a single unit, certainly one of the heroes of the hour. Um, cycle charging the Trebuchet crew into oblivion. Um, and very quickly now they're going to find themselves demolished as the Galathrum nobles also join in on the fun. And there we have it for the Trebuchet crew, Veterans of Osgiliath. Maybe the Frost Spears will be the last ones left alive, despite being focused pretty hard when they move forward in their full strength by the Elder Enway. Domed by an Elven arrow, the Gondor General finally falls. And yes, Dwarves of the Blue Mountains, technically the last ones left standing, the Frost Spears, though they will find themselves overrun in double quick time. Oof. <laughs> Projectiles sending people flying, getting more friendly fire than anything else. Both the Dwarves will stand back up. Five Elves dead. Oh, and there we have it. Surely now. There we go. A very good victory, and also quite a heartening one. Of course, most people tend to root for the elves in these kind of situations, and this perhaps is one of the better examples of how an outnumbered elven defensive victory is certainly possible. Because the attackers didn't do an awful lot wrong here. Like I said, maybe a few, you know, syncing things up a little bit differently, you know, committing units a little bit differently could have been done, and that would potentially have made the difference based on how close it ultimately was. Um, but it's not a case of the attackers needing to make serious mistakes for you know defenders to win in a 3v5, especially an Elven 3v5. So yeah, a really good uh, example of that, I would say. A very nice settlement as well, obviously, the Elven theme. Um, defenders made very good use of their defensive positions and ultimately their projectiles. Um, very even kill counts as well, so all of them definitely pulling an equal amount of weight. And also, I think all of them, it was showcase what they're actually all good at as Elven factions. In Ladris, that frontline strength that they had was very, very clear, and it did some really good work against a lot of the rank and file of Gondor and Arthur Dane, and was certainly able to even hold its own against um, augmented Dwarven quality attacks. Mirkwood, the real punch of those Entwives, again, it goes to show how the monstrous infantry units are a very key part of any faction that has them, and especially Mirkwood. Um, of course, it's been well documented with the Orcs and their trolls now, but Mirkwood, the level of damage that you can do and the level of chaos that you can sow in and amongst the enemy with the damage you're able to do, especially when you augment it with your heavy swordsman, as we saw here, it can be really quite scary, even for a very numerically gifted force like Dol Amroth, where here, the biggest army on the field today. Um, and then Lothlorien, plenty of arrow support and you know Galathrim support as well. 
Um, and we saw how the poison projectiles as well, all of the archers, crossfire on Rohan, late game as well, we saw Kindred of Caliborn, you know, we, lots of damage being done there. So we'll be able to see what did the damage for Dole Amroth, which Haven Guard, 236 casualties inflicted, considering the kind of force they were going up against is a lot. You know, it's a lot of good quality kills. The rest of the units, however, unsurprisingly really did struggle. I mean, Dole Amroth Spearman with 106 is not too bad at all. The rest, however... Halberdiers, by the time they move forward, they were definitely focused by some elite Merkwood archers, which, considering Merkwood don't have phalanx units of their own, that is how they're supposed to deal with phalanx units, and it's how they were here. Talon Knights did their best against the Entwives, but ultimately, again, Merkwood, perhaps better place to deal with that class of unit than many, in that being Mace Man. Lots of men-at-arms going for that rank-and-file approach, which I would have thought would, you know, was a winning thing, but ultimately, the Elves were able to punish them for that here. So yeah, big thank you to Tommy for sending this one to me, um, and a big thank you as well to all the players for being a part of this battle replay, and I believe as well this was a map created by Tommy, so again, it was a good one, so very much uh, thanks for that. Like I said, moving forward, I'm going to be catching up on pretty much everything I was sent in the period I was away. I think what's going to be happening is midweek battles, as and when I'm able to record them, are going to be covering the 2v2 tournament. Um, that's ongoing at the moment that's the basic idea I have and then weekends may be more battles like this as and where they're possible of course if that isn't the case if it is like entirely 2v2 stuff then it's going to be maybe two battles a week of that but yeah it's going to be rolling on for a little little while now I think that one and uh, it's sort of a, as, as a secondary form of, uh, form of battle that we're going to be seeing that effectively will of course fill the uh, pitch battle uh, requirement that I've been uh, Talk, that I talked about in the recent pitch battles that we showed so again how that's going to be structured at the moment I'm not quite sure I'll be recording as much as I can when I can given the fact that by the time Easter rolls around I will possibly be being dispatched for work once more but we'll see we will see but Yeah, big thank you to all the players once again hope you enjoyed this and I hope you'll join me for whatever is next